Romancing Saga is the Super Famicom successor to a really cool series of Japanese RPGs on the Game Boy called Saga. Um, I'm a big fan of the first two Saga games, uh, released here as the Final Fantasy Legend and Final Fantasy Legend 2. I think those games are really rad and do a lot of cool stuff with the form. Um, uh, they, they, recently, a um, translator called DDS Translation, who's made some fan translation of stuff like the Super Famicom remake of the first two Megami Tensei games and a bunch of other cool stuff, um, re um, released this beta translation. So I've been playing the first Romancing Saga. Um, it's kind of a challenging game in a lot of ways. The Romancing Saga series marked a pretty significant departure from a lot of the ideas in Saga 1 and 2. Saga 1 and 2 um, are fairly linear games. They progress in a straightforward way so that even though the progression systems are really complex and hard to wrap your head around, you can kind of just focus on that and the actual process of progressing through the game is fairly straightforward. Romancing Saga began the series' as, um, desire to be more non-linear, to be kind of open. Like in this game, after a short introductory segment, you literally are just kind of given free reign to do whatever you want, and then after you've finished a certain number of quests that they don't tell you really firmly, they just open up the end of the game, and you continue from there, and just hope that you're strong enough to beat the final boss. Um, the dungeon crawls are also fairly taxing for a number of reasons. Uh, as you can see, I'm actually playing the game now, um, and the f most challenging thing outright about Romancing Saga is that it's an astoundingly ugly video game. Um, it looks, it kind of looks like Final Fantasy V as interpreted by like a mid-tier RPG maker game. It doesn't really have a firm command of like architecture. It's not so much just that the fidelity of the graphics is kind of funky, it's that um, the actual architecture of the areas is just doesn't really have a strong command of space and it's very weird and illogical and ugly a lot of the time. This is an interesting, this is the first dungeon that actually has treasure chests. The other dungeons I've fought through uh, have a bunch of dead ends that just cut, they come out of nowhere. You're just supposed to go to the final boss and then there's nothing else in the entire area, which feels so weird for Japanese RPG. And also, there are a lot of encounters. Um, as you can see, there's there are just a ton of monsters in this area. It doesn't have random encounters, but it might as well, um, just with the sheer number of monsters swarming around you in a given location. Um, I was intending on just leaving all of them in so that you could get the full Romancing Saga dungeon crawl experience. But the, the full video wound up being like a half hour long, so I wound up cutting off all of the actual encounter, the encounters with monsters that we've already, that I've already um, fought once before. So you can see all the different monsters I fight, but you don't have to suffer through the, like, repeated encounters and everything. Um, here I'm equipping more weapon energy, and you can get a little hint of the UI in this game and all its kind of oddness. Um, monsters kind of home in on you, and your party formation is actually very important because you can't attack with swords from outside of the front row, and you can't attack with spears from the back row. Um, there are three rows, and bows can attack from all three, but I don't have any bow users right now. And if you get attacked from anywhere other than the side, then, from anywhere other than straight on, then your formation gets screwed up like it did just now. So I can't really attack fully until I move people upwards, which takes a full turn. Um, you can also see how the two of the p characters I grab here, well, completely different characters in the game, are just recolors of each other's sprites. It's all very like weird and budgety and buggy and strange, and it's just a very taxing game to try to wring enjoyment out of. But I kind of enjoyed the first two Saga games so much, and part of that was being able to look past and appreciate their eccentricities. So, honestly, I'm still kind of enjoying playing Romancing Saga. I've already looked down in that bottom corner and grabbed a treasure just there before the video. Um, so, I'm kind of willing to push forward more with Romancing Saga, because I want to 
kind of experience everything that this series has to offer. And as I understand it, um, the later Romancing Saga games on the Super Nintendo developed a lot further, and this one is kind of like a rough draft of sorts um, for the experiences that they would go on to make later, sort of like Saga 1 and Saga 2. Um, and my hope is that even though this game is very rough, like Saga 1 is, um, my hope is that I'll be able to find some kind of uh, intriguing or profound ideas in it that um, made Saga 1 so compelling to me. Because that is a fucking messy game, um, Saga 1. It's full of bugs. You can kill the final boss in one hit if you use a certain item that's easily acquirable be just because of they um, mix up a less than sign with a greater than sign in the code. <laughs> So an item that's supposed to be able to kill monsters instantly if they're weaker than you, have, have lower defense than you, kills monsters instantly if they have a higher defense than you, which really only comes into play during the final boss. Um, so that's a messy-ass game, and it's pretty ugly, too, in, in a lot of the same ways of Res Romancing Saga. In Saga 1, there are often, like, it will have, instead of a background tile to populate the floor with, it'll just have white space. And then it'll have large stretches with no walls, so you don't actually see that you're moving. And it doesn't look like anything you'd see in something like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy. And that's that's kind of part of the appeal, is that these are these weird-ass, messy, clunky things that are completely unlike any other RPGs out there, and aside from other Saga games. And even though they're messy, they've kind of reached... They slowly kind of develop this refinement over time. Like, I will die on that hill, on the hill. That Saga 2 is just a really, really well made Japanese RPG that I fucking love to bits. Um, huh. Alright, some more monsters. Um, you can see how they hone in on you. So, you can move around them kind of, but it's not really that easy to do. Um,. I, I made the comparison, the first time I played this game, it was like I was playing Earthbound with all the anti-piracy measures activated. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, but the, the dungeons aren't very long, thankfully, so the huge numbers of encounters don't feel too taxing, but as they could be. Like, the first dungeon is literally just one room where you walk straight up, but there's a ton of monsters, and it so it takes like 10, 15 minutes. Um... The boss fights aren't very dramatic so far. There's very little control of, like, the cinematic language of the Japanese RPG. Stuff that, like, Chrono Trigger or Final Fantasy VI or even Final Fantasy IV are just ridiculously good at controlling. There's just none of that going on in Romancing Saga. You are basically just engaging with these naked systems. And honestly, like, Kenji Ito's soundtrack um, that he worked on with Nobu Umatsu in... Um, Saga 2 is fucking amazing. I love that soundtrack. But the soundtrack in this game is has been very grating so far. Mostly because you are thankfully being given um, a new dun the dungeon theme. This is the first dungeon in the game that has its own dedicated theme. So far, every single other location in the entire game has used um, the default Albert theme, which is this tinny, trumpety kind of obnoxious tune that just plays ad nauseum for like two hours throughout the opening of this game in dungeons, in towns, um, everywhere but fights basically, which do um, encompass a huge portion of the game as you can tell. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's obviously off-putting about Romancing Saga, um, and oddly enough I looked at the um, 2006 Top 100 Video Games of All Time Famitsu poll, uh, where they where they pull Japanese gamers on their favorite video games. And naturally, it's mostly like Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, the mainstays of that culture. And there are two Saga games. The first was Romancing Saga, rated number rated um, around number 50, and the second was Saga 2. Um, which is strange that the other games in the series that, by all accounts, are m much more refined than Romancing Saga seem to have gone kind of overlooked by that culture. Um... And I'm kind of interested in seeing what they have to offer. I'm really excited about Saga Frontier. Um, because that game looks really pretty. And it also looks like it has a little more going on as far as like storytelling goes. 
And okay, it looks like once we get past these, once we get past these monsters, we're kind of clear for a little while. So that's nice. Um, there is a pretty significant variety of different monsters in the game, which is nice, although so far I've been able to kill them all with standard attacks. Um, but it's still ridiculous how many, how many encounters there are. Uh, so let's see if we can get past all of these at least. Um, Alright, there we go. Now we're in the clear. We can just move straight on up. We can take, take a save point. Um, in Saga, as in Saga 1 and 2, you can save anywhere in this game. And, oh, oh, <laughs> okay, as in Saga 1, um, you can save wherever you want, um, uh, oh, uh, as in Saga 1, you can save wherever you want, it's finding it difficult to keep my train of thought for some reason, <laughs> um, so it's possible to work yourself into unwinnable situations, uh, that's kind of the mainstay of the Saga series, is that, I, is that potential to irre irrevocably fuck up everything in your file and have to start over from scratch, and it provides a lot of tension. The weird thing is that in Saga 1 and 2, um, this is kind of made, this kind of, it, uh, works with this by not really requiring any grinding. Like, I didn't really grind at all while playing Saga 1 and Saga 2. It's possible, but because of the weapon durability, meaning that y your weapon use is limited, um, before you have to go buy new weapons, like kind of like Fire Emblem, it's not very really encouraged to grind, and um, you can also lose your abilities. And oh my God, there's so many monsters right here! This game is ridiculous. I, I kind of still enjoy playing it just for. Oh my God, there's so many! It's just so many. Ugh. All right, we're moving on to the last floor, almost. Okay, just a couple, couple more of these creatures. There's no way to avoid getting a side attack here. Um, huh. but Saga One, so the Romantic Saga, uh, there is no weapon durability, and you need to level up your weapon weapons in order to deal um, decent damage with them. So, there's no real incentive to not grind. In fact, it seems very highly encouraged, which makes it kind of a different. Um, sort of game than than the Saga 1 and 2. I haven't, it hasn't required me to do any grinding yet, so I don't know how it's going to work exactly, if it's just going to be straight up kind of a Dragon Quest riff, or, but with all of the weird Saga stuff around that. Or if it won't really require grinding and just kind of, if I can play through the game tactfully, tactfully I can and just focus on the strategy of not trying, of trying not to work myself into a winnable situation. Basically, the a huge portion of the saga experience is just trying to create a game-winning party. <laughs> um, with, because the final bosses are extremely hard, which I like. I like that the final bosses are just like the actual climax of the whole experience. And, oh man. <laughs> oh, this game is exhausting. <laughs> Alright, let's get past this first um um, staircase, just because I think that that just leads to a treasure chest. I think this is what the one that leads to the actual boss fight. Um, and like I said, when I played through this, this was um, this took a full half hour, so I managed to trim it down to just under 16 minutes by taking out a bunch of these encounters. And I told you that this game doesn't have a really strong control of cinematic language, like um, Final Fantasy does. Like just as early as Final Fantasy III. That series had an incredibly strong sense of drama, like the boss theme was was pumping, and there was um, a big prologue before the title screen played after the prologue with beautiful music, and there was like, you go off the island, and there's a big empty ocean, and, and it plays this haunting tune, there's a bunch of langu cool language stuff there in Final Fantasy III, and in Saga, Romancing Saga there's none of that. Look at this boss fight. I'm gonna get all pumped up and try to make sure everybody's healed up. This is the climax of this 30 minute ordeal. Let's see how difficult it is. It still is amazing that Theodore and Raphael's sprites are just recolors. Like that's ridiculous. Alright, let's do this. Alright, who are we fighting? This looks suspiciously like another random encounter I fought a lot of. Let's all, let's all just use our most powerful attacks here. You can recharge your falcon slashes by staying at the inn. 
Um, alright, let's see what we can do. Oh man. This is intense. Whew, oh my god. Oh man. Oh. Okay. Well, I guess that's the end of the dungeon. <laughs> now the only thing left to do is to walk out. <laughs> so let's go get the treasure up here and save the game. Romancing Saga is interesting and taxing and weird. Um, and I'm kind of enjoying the hell out of it anyway. Um, we'll see how long that lasts.